and we all enjoy watching them. Um, it's certainly the reason why I started looking at them 60 years ago. Birds are probably the most special amongst all of the animal taxa in terms of their range of colors, their color patterns, but I think we all just take that for granted. How many, how many of us actually stop to think about how, the, how those colors are generated and what, if anything, they mean? You can be up a mountain in the Cape in Southern Africa and see these two, two birds in the same bush. One is very well camouflaged and the other is very conspicuous. Do you actually wonder why one is conspicuous, one is, is, is camouflaged? I certainly never really thought about it very much. And it was actually on a trip to South America um, about five years ago, my wife and I went on a very adventurous trip uh, up a river in a dugout canoe over several days in southern Suriname. And an incident occurred that made me start to think seriously about color in birds. On the trip, we had with us this rather large man, Henk, who was our guide, uh, a wildlife generalist, and he also caught our dinner. And I said to, to, to Hank, I didn't have any bird list, I'm not a lister. Uh, I was happy with whatever I saw, but there was one bird, a very iconic bird I hoped to see, and it is of course the cock of the rock, which is not terribly rare, but it's found in that part of the world. Hank had seen it a few years earlier, and the following day, my wife and I spent the entire day struggling through the forest, and right near the end of the day, we saw the bird. In very dim light, I took quite a few photographs, and I have done this little animation to show what happened. <coughs> so the cock of the rock is about jackdaw sized. It's a bizarre looking bird. Three things stuck in my mind. Firstly, the incongruous color. I mean, it's just off the planet. I mean, it's the worst nightmare of the EasyJet marketing department. You know, why, why is it that color? How does it achieve the color? Secondly, was I lucky that it landed in a slightly brighter part of the forest floor where the, the, the camera could take a slightly better picture? And thirdly, it actually seemed to glow. Did I imagine that? So over the last few years, I've been studying color. Uh, there's a large number of hundreds of publications in the scientific press and several very good reviewed books. And I've put together a quick summary of what I've learned using photographs I've taken in Africa and many parts of Africa over the last few years to try and illustrate some of the points. So starting at the very basics, why is that letterbox red? Well, you're sitting there thinking because it's painted with red paint. But there's white light from the sun, so why is the letterbox red? And of course you learned at school, because the white light from the sun is a range of wavelengths that, that in the visible spectrum go from violet through to red. The red paint has a pigment, and that has the special property of absorbing the wavelengths that are not red, and it reflects red, so we see a red post box. If you put a red bird there, like this crimson breasted shrike in Botswana, the red feathers are because of a pigment which is carotenoid. Uh, birds uh, lack the enzyme to actually manufacture carotenoid, so they have to eat something that's got carotenoid, which is uh, plants, seeds, fruits, and anything that eats those things. And they can actually deposit carotenoid directly into their feathers, or they can metabolize it into different forms which have different optical properties and give rise to orange, yellow, and, and in different shades of oranges and, and yellows. So all of these birds here are colored uh, in their bright plumage with carotenoid. Birds that are red usually have black on them. The black is another pigment, which is melanin, which is the most common pigment in the animal kingdom. We all have it in our bodies. And you will see from this photograph that the southern red bishop on the right has a blacker black than the shrike on the left, which gives the clue that not all melanins are the same. And in fact, there are two main forms that occur in birds. There's eumelanin, which gives rise to birds that are fully black or in a lower density, birds that are gray, like the Ethiopian Abyssinian cat catbird. 
It also gives rise to uh, chestnut uh, and a range of brown colors. And in this wheat ear, you'd have eumelanin there and theomelanin there. So you might think that all brownish birds or grayish birds are colored by, in the brown case, the pheomelanin, but you'd be wrong because bustards, owls, and nightjars have their own unique pigment, which is porphyrin. Luckily, these aren't squashed on a, on a fence, but these are two bustards found in Crocoland in northwestern <coughs> Namibia. So what about birds that are non-iridescent blue? Well, this is a bit of a trick question. If you start counting how many British birds have non-iridescent blue in their plumage, you need only one hand. Blue is obviously rather special. And the reason is because there is no blue pigment in the, in the avian world, not in their feathers, not in their skin, not in their bills. More remarkable, there's no blue pigment in the integument of any vertebrate animal, with just two exceptions, which are both fish found in the Pacific. So how do these obviously blue birds get their blue plumage? I'm going to take you to New Zealand to explain the answer. Uh, if you take the A8 between Christchurch and Queenstown, you'd pass through this rather nondescript town called Tekapo which is on the edge of a very large freshwater lake. If you've been there, you might think, well, that's not quite how I remember it, and that's because I've changed the color of the water to look like it would if it was rainwater running off the hills. In fact, Lake Tekapo looks like that. That is a real non-enhanced photograph. And the blue color is because all of this water is from melted glaciers, and the glaciers grind up rocks, and suspended rock particles in the water preferentially refract short wavelength blue light to give that blue water. In the same way, birds that are non-iridescent blue in their plumage have feather barbs that have a keratin and air vacuole structure that does the same refraction process. So blue is a structural color, not a pigmented color. The hammer cups on the left there are colored with probably eumelanin, I think. The little egret has no pigment in its feathers. It incoherently scatters all wavelengths of sunlight. So white is a structural color. The one color I haven't mentioned is green. Well, green is the most complicated color of all. There are three major mechanisms. Um, the most common is a mixture of pheomelanin and carotenoid. Some birds, however, have a yellow carotenoid overlaid with a blue structural color. But green pigeons, of which there are four species in Africa and the offshore islands, are very special because within their green wing feathers, there is a structure in the, the feather barbs that uh, refract, uh, coherently refracts light to give a green color. So that's a non-pigmented green color. So you might think, well, how many ways are there of coloring a bird? And the answer is a lot. Um, eumelanin gives rise to grays and blacks. Pheomelanin generally light browns through dark browns to chestnuts. Bright reds and bright yellows are carotenoid-based pigments. Blues and whites are structural, there's no pigment involved. Greens are these three complicated different mechanisms. However, if you're a Churico, Churicos have their own unique pigments that give their special greens and pinks. Parrots have their own special pigment that gives the yellows and the reds. And as I mentioned, the bustards, nightjars, and owls have their own porphyrin pigment. Why is it so complicated? Well. Evolutionary ecologists have um, done ancestral state reconstructions of avian lineages and found that there have been many extinctions, uh, coherent evolution patterns, um, gains and losses of dimorphism, monomorphism. And as a result, there are groups of birds like crows and ravens that only use eumelanin, so they're all black or gray or unpigmented, but other 
and many other birds, like this very pretty swee waxbill, pretty much display all of the mechanisms that they can, including really showing off by having uh, melanin in the upper mandible and carotenoid in the lower mandible. <clears throat> but what really gives birds a wow factor is iridescence. Iridescence has fascinated scientists for hundreds of years, and of course it was the greatest scientist in my view of all time, Isaac Newton, who with a piece of paper, a pencil, and a giant brain worked out what, what the process was. And in 1704, he described how it was the thinness of what he called very fine hairs on the branches of the feathers. And what he meant, I will demonstrate with a feather from a Cape starling. Well, the Cape starling is, is, is a wonderfully iridescent bird. It ranges from uh, pale blue through dark blue to black. About a year ago, I was in Zimbabwe doing some field work, and I watched some of these birds preening, and one of them dropped a feather. And I picked up the feather, which, and I took a photograph on the top, top left. And I then took a, a photograph with a macro lens, and I then zoomed in on the computer. And you could see that all of the color uh, is from the region. This is the main shaft. These are the barbs. <coughs> and the color is from the region in between. And that region in between is where the barbules are, and that's what Newton was referring to when he talked about the fine hairs. Well, that's the limit of the resolution of uh, what I could do, but luckily, a group of physicists have taken scanning electron microscope photographs of feather barbules, and that's what they look like. So they're not so much fine hairs, they're very fine spatulas, and another group of uh, Chinese physicists in 2006 um, actually then cut through a barbule and took this scanning electron microscope cross-sectional picture. And if you zoom in again, that's what it looks like in fine detail. So to give an idea of the scale of the thickness of a barbule, the human hair is about 60 to 80 microns. It's about 25 to 30 times as thick as that. And the process of iridescence occurs uh, right in this top layer, which this is a layer of keratin, these little uh, popcorn-shaped things are, are molecules of... The process of iridescence is when uh, uh, sunlight strikes the upper surface of the keratin and the lower surface. Uh, the path length through, through a different optical medium cause different um, um, wavelengths of light to go at different speeds, and the, the emerging waves recombine coherently <laughs> to give a certain hue, which is different depending on where your eye is. Now you may wonder, well, if that's the reason, why aren't all uh, feathers iridescent? And the answer is because if you look at a non-iridescent feather from a pigeon, that's what it looks like. So it doesn't have the same keratin structure. So depending on the thickness of that keratin uh, and the uh, incident angle of the light, you get different colors of iridescence, ranging from greens through blues, amethyst, even, even bronze. And we get this wonderful range of colors. So with all of these mechanisms that generate color and iridescence, you have a complete rainbow of colors of African birds from a, a red-billed firefinch in red to a Meeves's starling in violet. And you may wonder, why are birds quite so colorful? I mean, they're absolutely dazzling. And that has worried or uh, occupied the minds of biologists for many centuries. And of course, the great Charles Darwin thought about it a great deal. And in his Origin of Species book in 1859, he was easily able to explain the camouflage process uh, leading to the color. But what bothered Darwin was he couldn't explain birds that were very, very brightly colored. So for example, this lilac-breasted roller, you would think natural selection would actually uh, force a lilac-breasted roller to become a camouflage bird that basically looked like that. You would think its life expectancy would be much longer if a lilac-breasted roller was like that. The bird that really bothered Darwin was the peacock. He couldn't understand why it was so colorful and he couldn't understand why it had such a a wonderful but totally pointless tail that, that um, affected its flight. In an African context, there are many birds with long tails that are very elegant, 
But surely, if you, if you chop that tail off, um, that bird would fly much better. Well, I took these photographs in Nairobi National Park of the pintail rider, and here you can begin to see, um, possibly, probably, why uh, this wider male has this long tail. It's using it to display to this rather startled looking female. And Darwin built up these ideas of uh, what enhanced plumage and ornamentation in male birds, and he published uh, in his Ascent of Man book in 1871, he published his ideas about sexual selection, which he, he believed operated through two processes. So on the one hand, it was, he saw it as a male-male competition to control territory, resources, and access to mates. And that developed through agonistic encounters. It developed bright plumages and, and, and um, uh, unusual ornamentation. And on the other hand, he believed that females uh, were likely to choose the males as mates if they had these more extreme um, uh, forms of coloration. Well, it was about 100 years before anybody did any experiments on birds to see whether there was any truth in that. And one of the first birds that was studied was an African bird, the village weaver. Uh, Callias and others um, took some breeding uh, male, uh, breeding condition male African uh, village weavers and they artificially darkened the plumage of the birds. And they found that the females had a strong preference for the brighter colored males. About 20 years later, uh, some very interesting work was done on red-collared widow birds. Uh, Pryke and others established that the males with the brightest colors and the most extensive areas of red on the head were the ones that success most successfully gained territories. The females, on the other hand, went for the males that had the longest tails. But, but all of these experiments and many others sort of helped to confirm a, a lot of Darwin's ideas. Some years ago, I was in northern Tanzania, and I, I spent several hours uh, in a hide photographing Tavita weavers. Um, so the uh, top right uh, female, typical female, was being chased around, and she was chasing many males. And I took a couple of hundred photographs and looked at them later, and I could see this big range of uh, male, all, the other five birds are all males, uh, male coloration. And I would suspect, although the work hasn't been done on this bird, that the female would have targeted that one uh, in line with lots of other work that's been done as her preferred mate. Well, Alfred Russell Wallace had a completely different set of ideas. He believed that it was nothing, that was complete nonsense, and that natural selection was what drove crypsis in females. So he, and his prime example was the blackbird, but he said the female blackbird was incredibly dull. It was dull because it's, it, so it alone did the incubation on the nest, and the nest was open, so it was vulnerable to predation. But there was no such pressure on males, so males could be colorful. He also said that if birds nest in holes, or they make enclosed nests, then there was no selection pressure, so females could be brightly colored. And I suspect, I put in a couple of photographs from Northern Australia, because he was based a lot in Wallacea, he was probably thinking of birds like this, where the, the pattern is very true. So he said that there should not be uh, cryptically colored whole nesting birds. If you look in an African context, how do his, his ideas stack up? Well, you need to know which bird does the incubation. This is an example, Cape Rock Thrush. The female alone does the incubation. It's relatively drab, the male is brightly colored. So it fits Wallace's model, but there are many, many exceptions. Um, this is Rappel's Robin Chat. All of the robin chats, many other birds, are open nesters, and both male and female are conspicuously colored. If you look at whole nesting birds in Africa, then Wallace seems to have a good point, because all of the bee eaters, barbets, kingfishers, woodpeckers, generally are conspicuous male and female. But if you look further, there are an awful lot of exceptions. So the violet backed starling is a whole nester, the female is, is cryptic. All of the sunbirds, all of the bishops, the females are cryptic. So there are quite a lot of holes in, in Wallace's argument if you look in Africa. But I think this is probably the real killer. Two years ago, there was a big study of uh, the relative predation rates, and it showed that uh, enclosed nests did not reduce predation. Probably the biggest critic of all is 
Professor Richard Prum, who is the expert on color. He's published more on color in birds and other animals over the last 30 years than anyone else. And he feels that Wallace's ideas completely distort Darwin's. They're totally wrong, and they imply that beauty is a utility. Prum actually goes further. He he's, loves this. He's an American. He loves a little catchphrase, beauty happens. But the interesting thing that he says, based on his work on mannequins, is that he believes that um, uh, some of these sexual sele selection processes are leading to the development of redundant ornamentation that he feels could lead to the extinction of species, which is a real challenge for conservationists. Totally different viewpoint on color from this man. Hugh Cross was a professor at Cambridge University. He published a very uh, well-regarded book in 1940 on animal colors, and he was an expert on camouflage. And as a result, in 1941, he was in the British Army in Egypt. Amazingly, despite it being 1941, late 41, he had a week's leave and went birding. And he shot these two birds, amongst others, and he, in the garden of a friend, he started preparing their skins. Uh, and he disposed of the corpses behind him. And about an hour later, he turned around and looked down and took this photograph and was amazed at what he saw. saw. The carcass on the left is the laughing dove. And on the right is the kingfisher. And the one on the left is covered in hornets. But there are no hornets on the one on the right. So he started to wonder what the difference in the flesh was. And he started to wonder whether it was aposematism, which is a well-known phenomenon in many reptiles, amphibians, and a few uh, mammals, whether the bright colors uh, or conspicuousness, in the case of the kingfisher, uh, were sending out signals that there was something, uh, that it was unpalatable or unprofitable prey. Um, he published a paper in 1947 on this idea, but a much more interesting paper, frankly, uh, 20 years later, with Con Benson, one of the great names in African ornithology, who was, um, had obviously read of Cott's ideas. Benson, in the 1950s, was working in Zambia. Uh, he collected a very large number of birds, named a number of new species, and he had no shortage of corpses of birds to do experiments on. Benson took a very different approach, though. Benson decided to taste them. I don't think they wore Tudor costumes like this, but he did assemble a panel of eight people who did blind tastings of birds. They tasted all of these, and 187 others. They tasted a quarter of the Zambian list. Now, the way they tasted them, as I say, it was a blind tasting. Uh, Benson's wife, Molly, um, she's bottom, bottom right, um, she prepared just the pectoral muscle in the kitchen. So you can imagine how many scarlet chests some birds went into it. Um, she cooked them in a frying pan with no oil, no condiments, and people uh, didn't know what the species was. They just wrote down the number between two and nine to de decide how palatable they were. Benson put together all that information together with his own views as a, as a field ornithologist on how conspicuous the birds were in terms of either color or behavior. And he found a very strong inverse relationship between uh, cryptic birds were the most tasty, uh, conspicuous birds were the least tasty. And if you wonder which was which, the least tasty, uh, the bottom score is actually two rather than naught very unpleasant, the black cuckoo. So it's not terribly colorful, but very conspicuous. And the tastiest of all, the water thickney. Excellent. Now, I think this paper was probably, it was actually at the Pan-African Conference in 1969. It was probably read uh, and uh, listened to rather politely, but nobody took it terribly seriously. I suspect because it was regarded as very subjective, people wondered whether human views were relevant. And I think um, there was some suspicion about the statistics. But 25 years later, a Swedish scientist reanalyzed all the same data and came up with not quite the same, but very similar conclusions that aposematism is one of the reasons. Be that what it may, you could be certain this will never be repeated because it would be regarded as completely unethical. Well, if you think that was a bit odd, wait till you hear about Abbott Thayer. Abbott Thayer was an American uh, 
artist, a very um, successful artist. He painted portraits of society ladies, made a lot of money. He painted angels, which is probably why he looked so startled. Uh, and he also had a strong interest in wildlife. And he was convinced that all coloration of any type was camouflage. And he set about trying to prove that by, through his paintings. And I think he probably chose the peacock to get at Darwin because he made a peacock disappear by painting it like this. And he did the American wood duck in, in dapple light like that to make the wood duck disappear. And he got a bit of a following, and his ideas were sort of partly taken up. But where he took a wrong turn was trying to paint flamingos. Now, flamingos, this is Walvis Bay Lagoon. They're very colorful, very large, and pretty hard to hide. But Thayer man managed to make them disappear into the sunset and the sunrise. It made him a bit of a laughing stock. And even by then, the, the ex-president of the US got involved and suggested a serious scientist look at this. So why do I even mention Thayer? Well, he did um, promote several ideas that are important in biology today. One was countershading. The other was um, disruptive patterns. So the top two birds, the Corsa and the Lapwing, are actually quite strikingly colored. But because of the way the colors are on, on the plumage, they're quite well camouflaged in that situation. On the bottom two pictures, the birds are already well camouflaged, but it's even better because of the uh, white wing patches. Getting that. Um, Thayer thought he'd make a bit of money out of this. He took on a patent on, on disruptive coloration, and he tried to sell it to the military in the First World War without success until his patent ran out, and then it was widely adopted. So next time you're at the Okavango River and you see a scene like this, uh, the white fronted bee eaters, don't just think, oh, God, I wish they had been Bohm's bee eaters, which are much rarer. Just marvel at the incredible colors, the, the white, the blue, the structural colors, the black melanin, the fear melanin, the carotenoid, and even some iridescence. And imagine you could wave a wand and Charles Darwin was there. And he'd say, oh, that's all to do with the sexual selection, the struggle for mates. If Alfred Russell Wallace was there, he'd say, a complete nonsense, it's because they nest in holes in the river bank and they, the females can be conspicuous. Richard Prom would say, stop corrupting it. His theory is beauty happens. Con Benson would say, get me a shotgun and a frying pan and I'll show you it's aposemitism. <laughs> and Abbott Thayer would say, be eaters, I can't even see them. <laughs> I'll finish where I began, which is with the uh, Guyan and Cock of the Rock. Um, I had three questions. Where did the color come from? Easy peasy, carotenoid. They ingest it from the fruits of the forest. But the other two questions, was I lucky that it landed where it did in a slightly brighter area, and did it really glow? Well, the answers are very uh, well-researched and very elegant. If I could position myself at the top of one of those trees with a spectrometer, and measure the wavelengths of light, um, so the colors against the intensity, it's broadly a flat um, spectrum. If I abseil down to the ground and do the same measurement, then the wavelengths are very sharply peaked in the green. So on the ground in the forest shade, if you put a green bird there, it glows bright green. But if you put an orange bird there, like the cock of the rock, it looks brown. But if the sun then moves on, and it illuminates a little bit of ground like that, and you put your spectrometer there, you find that the light there is strongly peaked in the orange and the red. So this bird, cock of the rock, sitting there, does appear to glow. And it knew exactly where to stand to do its ritualized dance, uh, effectively like being in the West End of London in its finest costume in a pantomime under an orange spotlight showing, it, showing itself off. All that was missing was I thought it would tip its top hat and then fly off. And when you look closely, that's what it does. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>